Great. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, for organizing this event. And thanks uh, so much also to uh, Tim and Andrew for taking part in this and talking about these ideas. Thanks to all of you for coming. So I've got a, just a few slides. I'm going to um, go through just uh, hopefully not much more than 10 minutes, just a very brisk overview of themes from the book Reality Plus and a few central theses. Of course, this is going to mean that uh, that uh, this is going to be more in the line of theses than arguments. But uh, somebody once told me anyway that the great philosophers don't argue. Uh, the book is actually full of uh, full of arguments. But here I'll do my best to imitate a great philosopher by uh, by by not arguing, just uh, presenting some central theses. So let me uh, share the screen and call up keynote. There we go. So here is uh, the uh, the uh, American and the English covers of Reality Plus. The subtitle is Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. And I think of it as a philosophical inquiry into virtual worlds, as well as an investigation of the light that virtual worlds can shed on some quite traditional problems of philosophy. What is a virtual world? Well, to, a rough definition is a virtual world is an interactive, computer generated world. The most key thing is generated by a computer, but also interactivity is important. Here's a paradigm virtual world, the world of second life, uh, a social virtual world, massive multiplayer world used by many people for all kinds of social purposes, peaked around 2007, but still going now, in which uh, it's, it's all generated by a computer. People can go in there, they can, uh, they can interact, it's not yet full-scale virtual reality. To be virtual reality, you have to meet an extra condition. Virtual reality is an immersive, interactive, computer-generated world where the, uh, the extra condition is the one of immersiveness. That is, you experience it from the inside in three dimensions as if you're present there at the center. And the standard way to experience virtual reality right now is with a VR headset, such as here, the Oculus Quest 2. Here's my own. You, uh, you, enter, the, uh, you enter the headset and suddenly, oh my God, there's a, whole, there's a whole world around you, a computer generated world. Um, paradigmatic virtual worlds in science fiction um, are everywhere, but perhaps the paradigmatic virtual world and indeed virtual reality is the matrix. Um, a virtual world that people get to live in for their entire lives, uh, indistinguishable from a physical reality uh, until perhaps at some point you take a red pill and you discover you've been in such a world as happens for, uh, for Neo in the matrix. Another paradigmatic virtual world is the so-called metaverse. Whereas you, know, you spend your whole life in the matrix, the metaverse you just enter for a little while in Neil Stevenson's novel, Snow Crash. Snow Crash, it's a virtual world where people enter, spend their time, build relationships, build communities, work, play, but then you, then you, know, you come out and you come back to ordinary reality. So I think here of the matrix as representing the full scale science fiction scenario that we might be living in a virtual world, the metaverse, reflects the somewhat more down to earth possibility of coming virtual reality technology and the virtual worlds in which we might be increasingly spending our time. So I think all this really deserves a lot of philosophical thought. My central thesis is that virtual reality is genuine reality. There's a long tradition of seeing virtual reality as a second class reality, a fake or fictional reality, an illusion or a hallucination. I don't think it needs to be any of those things. Virtual reality can be genuine reality, different from physical reality, ultimately a kind of digital reality, but no less real for all that. And that breaks down into three subtheses. One thesis is the idea that genuine reality might turn out to be a virtual reality, the world we're already in, could be a virtual reality. This is the so-called simulation hypothesis about which I'll say more in a second. I don't say that we are 
in such a simulation, but I do think it's a possibility that we can't rule out. Second, I wanna say virtual reality is not an illusion or a fiction. The objects you encounter in virtual reality are real. Events in virtual reality really happen. These may be digital objects and digital events ultimately made of digital processes, but that doesn't make them an illusion or a fiction. They're no less real for all that. And third, we can lead a meaningful life in virtual reality. There's a long tradition again of saying, VR must be escapism, can't be fully serious. What happens there isn't really meaningful. I wanna argue that in principle, we can lead a fully meaningful life in virtual reality. Okay, so I'll just say a little bit more about each of those three theses in the time remaining. First, the simulation hypothesis, the idea that our own reality could turn out to be a virtual reality, a computer simulation. This is wonderful for a philosopher because it goes back to all these ancient ideas and philosophy. The, the, the Chinese philosopher, Zhuangzi, who said, how do I know I'm not now a butterfly dreaming that he's Zhuangzi? Or Rene Descartes, who said, how do I know I'm not being fooled by an evil demon into thinking there's this world around me when none of it is real? Here, uh, I've got an illustration of the high-tech version of the evil demon. By the way, all these illustrations, uh, there are 57 of them in the book by a marvelous illustrator, Tim Peacock, who did just such a great job of bringing some of these philosophical scenarios to life. This is the Descartes scenario of the evil demon um, trying to deceive somebody, but here we have a very high-tech evil demon who's using uh, digital technology to fool this brain in a vat because the, the brain in the vat says, well, okay, I don't know anything about the stuff out there, but I know that I'm here. I'm thinking, therefore I am, but it does. But, you know, but basically the brain here is in a version of the simulation situation. And the, the simulation hypothesis is basically an updated version, high-tech version of Descartes' hypothesis. Here's a version as it appears in the matrix. We have Trinity talking to the Oracle. Trinity is a bit like a brain in a vat. She's got a biological brain and body which connects to the simulation. The Oracle is a pure simulation. She's one of the machines. So she's actually running on a computer herself. This illustrates two quite different ways that you know, we could turn out to be in a simulation, either as a brain or as a computer, both versions of the simulation hypothesis. Now I would say simulation technology is actually becoming common. This is moving from being science fiction to being real technology. Give it 50 or 100 years, we'll have simulated universes indistinguishable from physical ones. So it's actually becoming, a, this Cartesian possibility is actually becoming a live possibility that there will be simulated universes. And I argue that we cannot ever have conclusive evidence that we're not in a simulation, roughly because any evidence could be simulated. So that the simulation uh, hypothesis is in principle indistinguishable from the physical reality hypothesis, at least if we suppose a perfect simulation. So that's how we get to the first main claim. We can't know we're not in a simulation. And I think basically the existence of this technology has had the, uh, has had the effect of actually strengthening some of Descartes' points there. So you might think, bad news, we might be in a simulation, but the rest of it is good news. It turns out that being in a simulation is not as bad as you might have thought. I mean, there's a very common view that simulations are illusions, that virtual reality is illusory reality. But my view is this common view is wrong. Even if we are in a simulation, ordinary things around us are perfectly real. There are still tables and chairs and planets and people. They may be digital objects, but they're no less real for all that. So here's the American philosopher Cornel West uh, expressing the common view. He actually appears in the uh, Matrix movies as Counselor West of Zion. You can see him here escaping one simulation after another. And he says, it's illusions all the way down. Even the reality we're in may be such an illusion. Um, I don't rule out that it's simulations all the way down, but I contest that the simulations need to be illusions. Here's a picture that I find more appealing. Here's the, uh, the simulator 
creating a simulation and in fact creating a new reality by running uh, a simulation. It may be a digital reality. Uh, if we're actually in a simulation, we're in a world where the stars and galaxies are themselves digital objects, but they're no less real for, uh, for all that. It's a version of what's sometimes called the it from bit idea, where real objects out there, physical objects are made of bits, but I think they're no less real. But this does raise deep philosophical questions, like what is real? Questions actually raised in the Matrix movie when Neo says, this isn't real. Morpheus says, well, what is real? How do you define real? So you need to get into exactly what we mean uh, by real. I think maybe Andrew will get into that a little bit, but I would argue that in all the key senses of reality in which physical objects are real, digital objects can be perfectly real too, and they needn't be illusions. Okay, this gets us to the third question. Can you lead a meaningful life in a virtual world? Again, a long tradition of people saying no to this, uh, to this question. You know, a common view of virtual reality is maybe it's something like Plato's cave. Uh, here's a high tech version of uh, Plato's cave. Plato's cave for the 21st century. Remember in Plato's cave, people see shadows of reality on the cave wall on a common view You've got three prisoners chained up to VR, seeing shadows of reality. By the way, that's Mark Zuckerberg there running, uh, running Plato's Cave. So this is a dystopian take on virtual reality, where it's just essentially second class and meaningless. Here's Robert Nozick's case of the experience machine. Um, you know, your body is actually floating in a tank. You have these pre-scripted experiences of amazing things going on. Nozick said, uh, should you enter the experience machine? Absolutely not. It's meaningless. Nothing there really ever happens. I actually argue for a quite different view that you can lead a meaningful life in VR. Here's an illustration of the situation as I see it. Two people, the choice between entering virtual reality into that pod that will connect you to this amazing digital world in which people can fly and so on with their digital bodies. Or you can get on a rocket ship and go off to a terraform planet, terraform reality, and, uh, and live an equivalent life there. I think both of those worlds, you can have perfectly meaningful experiences. There'll be other people there, I'm assuming. You can build communities there. You can build relationships there. You can struggle to build a better world there. Maybe you can, there are some advantages to one, some advantages to the other, but both are equally meaningful. In both cases, we are conscious beings who invest out the worlds around us with meaning. You can do that equally for virtual reality and for physical reality. So I'd say you can live a meaningful life in VR. That's not to say it has to be, it's gonna be wonderful. Physical reality is sometimes wonderful, sometimes awful. Same for virtual reality. I'd say VR has very clear, both utopian and dystopian potential. And we need to be very careful as it becomes a, more and more central in our lives to try and make it realize something closer to the utopian than the dystopian potential. But I would argue that the full scale of human experience is available in virtual world. So to summarize, virtual reality is genuine reality. I would say the rest is up to us. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dave. So, um... Now I'm going to ask some questions and then after that, Tim will come in. And I guess I'll start by just saying that I thought the book was great. Uh, I think it's a very cool exploration of a variety of central philosophical questions um, with a focus on virtual reality and, and technology. And it's also really accessible. So I think that you know even those who aren't philosophers or who haven't studied philosophy uh, are going to find it very, readable and accessible and interesting. So to go right into the questions, one question that I wanted to ask is about the notion of realness. And I guess one thing I was wondering is, why does it matter whether something is real? So you spend a lot of time in the book arguing that virtual objects and virtual worlds are real. Um, and speaking for myself, I've and pretty sympathetic to those arguments. But 
I also found myself wondering what exactly turns on whether we label something as real or not. You could imagine somebody who says, well, we could just draw a spectrum of realness where some things are more real than others. Maybe physical objects are more real than virtual objects and virtual objects more real than imaginary objects and imaginary objects more real than fictional objects. And where does it really, what does it really matter where we draw the line between what's real or not? What's exactly at stake here in calling something real? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think, first of all, at a broad intuitive level, I think most of us care about whether things are uh, out there or are real. If it turns out that our, ex our experiences, you know, at a given time, say a relationship we had or an experience we had, you know, walking, um, an adventure we had, it turns out that wasn't real. If it was, say, mere, if it was, say fictional or illusory, that would make it somehow less meaningful to us and somehow it would make the experience more disappointing. So intuitively, we value that, you know, I, mean, I think it's very important to me, my partner, for example, that, that she's real. Um, that actually breaks down, though, into a number of notions. I think there is no single fixed notion of reality. So one thing in the, in the book that I argue is that maybe there's actually at least five different strands in our notion of reality. Maybe you can find different strands. And I, those include that something makes a difference, that is, that it has causal powers, that something is out there independently of one's mind. It's not just being uh, being part of one's mind, uh, that something is not an illusion. And I think all of those actually matter to us in somewhat different ways. I mean, I agree it's a somewhat semantic question, what you call real, what you don't call real. But I do think we care about, you know, that, uh, that the things we experience are actually out there, outside our minds, making a difference to us, and I think we especially care that they're not illusions. We care that things are roughly the way uh, they seem. If, if nothing is the way it seems, if my relationship with my partner is a total illusion or a hoax, then that's, uh, then that's disappointing. So probably it would be interesting to go down all five notions of reality and say, which are the ones we should care about the most and why? And I, think, I mean, I agree that in a way, in the book, actually, I argue that some things are 80% real because they meet four of the five criteria for, uh, for reality. And maybe some things will end up 60% real. So actually, I don't mind having, a, having some kind of scale as you, as you suggest. But I guess for more fine-grained analysis, then we'd want to go into each of those, say, those five notions and say, why is that something that we care about? But, you know, I do think that a lot of things, these things are things that we actually care about. The things are real in these senses. So just to probe at that question a little bit. So you mentioned these different criteria for realness, uh, things like having causal powers, being illusory, being mind independent, and how we do seem to care about those sorts of things. And that seems right to me. But then I guess one thing I wonder still is, do we really care about whether something is real over and above these different individual criteria for realness? Or is it really just that in individual cases, we care about whether something is an illusion or not, whether something has causal powers or not, whether something is ultimately mind independent or not? I mean, I guess you could think that, well, that's still an indirect way of caring about whether something is real. Um, but I guess I was wondering your thoughts on, on, on this. Yeah, I don't think I'm making the claim that we care about whether something is real over and above caring about those five things. I think, you know, those five things basically are what it is to be real on different understandings of being real. And our caring about those things might well end up exhausting why we care about something being, uh, being real. I mean, to me, that's, that doesn't mean we don't care about whether something is real. These are, these are just different ways of cashing out what it is for something to be real. Okay, so let me turn to another question. You talk a lot about simulated beings in the book. So let's say that a sim is a simulation of a human. And my second question is, should we really think that sims have the same experiences as the humans that they simulate? So I think that you were inclined towards an affirmative answer in the book. And I guess speaking for myself, I'm more inclined towards agnosticism. And one reason for that is that I feel uncertain um, 
One reason I feel uncertain is that the structure of the sims wouldn't exactly mirror the structure of the humans that they simulate. So there would be there would be a perfect mirroring if we're looking at the simulated structure of the sims and the uh, the physical structure of the humans. But the sims are also going to have all of this additional structure, um, all of this non-simulated structure that realizes the simulated structure. And because of that, there's going to be a whole lot more structure to the sims than to the humans. And it's going to look quite different at a fundamental level. So for example, um, if we're looking at a human, then a human will ultimately be, be made of cells and organic matter. Um, they'll be spatially contiguous. Whereas a simulation of the human that's ultimately going to be some kind of distributed data structure and some kind of computer network. And at a fundamental physical level, those are going to look very different. So to clarify, I'm not expressing skepticism about the idea that there could be conscious simulated beings, but I guess I'm wondering why we should think that a simulation of a human is going to have the same experiences as the uh, human that's being simulated. Maybe these differences at this fine grain fundamental physical level is going to make for some differences in consciousness. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, this all pertains to a, uh, to a fourth thesis in the book that, uh, that I, I mentioned in the introduction as an ancillary thesis, which is roughly virtual minds are genuine minds, saying roughly something similar to the mind as I'm also saying for reality. Remember we had that picture of Trinity with a brain and the Oracle with a computer, with a digital mind, I want to say both of them in principle can be conscious and there's nothing special about biology. But yeah, you might still think that, that uh, okay, well, they can both still be conscious, but there'd be something different about their consciousnesses. And as a matter of fact, I think that probably if we had analogs of the Oracle and the Trinity, they would have totally different consciousnesses because the Oracle's brain, simulated brain probably runs on entirely different principles from Trinity's brain. But here, I guess we're focusing on the special case, where just say the Oracle was set up as a simulation of Trinity from the start. We've got a biological brain, and then we have a perfect simulation of that biological brain. One thing I try to argue, um, and this goes back to my first book, The Conscious Mind in the mid nineties, where I gave two different arguments here involving kind of gradually transitioning from one to the other. The first was what I called fading the possibility of, you know really the possibility of kind of gradual replacement where we replace say neurons one at a time by silicon chips. And I try to make the case that if you're conscious at the beginning, you're conscious at the end. And then you might say, okay, you're conscious at the end, but what if your consciousness changes along the way? Then I get a thought experiment going where you have say both the neural circuit and a silicon circuit there at once and you switch between them. And I try and make the case that if you switch between them, then the subject won't notice and that'd be kind of very implausible. They'd undergo giant changes in consciousness without noticing. So I tried to make the case that even these two isomorphic uh, beings would have the same kind of consciousness. Now I agree, this is not a knockdown argument. Consciousness is very weird, very mysterious. And it's, yeah, it's entirely possible that something below the information processing level makes some difference to consciousness. Maybe you know, one idea is that all that functional structure that information processing fixes the structure of consciousness, but, but something underlying all that may make a difference somehow to the qualities, you know, a bit like the idea that someone else would see different colors from you. Maybe these, uh, these, uh, the brain and the simulation could experience colors with the same structure, but different qualities. I mean, I don't rule that out. I think there's just a, there's just a prima facie case for, uh, for, uh, for similarity. Here And I guess I also think that maybe the structure of consciousness is the most important part. I call there was one Andrew Lee who argued that the structure of consciousness is the key to uh, the science of consciousness. And I recommend you all, you all check that out. Yeah, so I think that's an interesting hypothesis about what might be going on in these gradual replacement cases. Maybe the structure of the conscious experiences remains the same, but the qualities differ in some way. And speaking for myself, that, that seems like at least a pretty plausible hypothesis for a pretty live candidate. And I think one thing that's interesting that arises from this is that you make this gradual replacement argument in the book um, and in some of your previous work. And I think that there's a pretty strong case that consciousness is preserved 
Um, and then maybe a somewhat weaker case that the exact same conscious experience is preserved, at least if we're entertaining the hypothesis that maybe the structure is preserved, but the qualities change, then somebody could agree that, well, the resulting um, subject that is now made of uh, silicon, out of, made out of like a bunch of computer chips, maybe they'll still be conscious, but their experiences will be different in some ways. Uh, maybe the structure of the experience will be preserved, but maybe there will be some uh, differences in intrinsic character that change. Uh, so I think that's one live hypothesis that arises when we're thinking about these gradual replacement cases. And that seems to me something that really might turn out to be the case if we're thinking about these gradual replacement scenarios where a human is gradually transformed into a, a, a sim. I, mean, I think also a, an interesting thing here is that maybe the case for preservation of sameness of experience is actually a little bit stronger when we're thinking about gradual replacement where uh, a human is turned into like a robot uh, versus gradual replacement when a human is turned into a sim. At least there's a little bit more distance when we're thinking about the transformation into a sim, this uploading scenario, versus when we're thinking about the transformation into a robot. Yeah, that, that last thing is interesting. Although I, I guess I think you can fairly easy get continuity going between say a, a robot duplicate with a whole bunch of silicon chips interacting in parallel here and maybe some parallel computing device uh, where all that's taking place. And, you know, just say you've got a simulation that involves, uh, okay, it's got to simulate the states of 86 billion neurons. And I'm thinking, okay, it'll do this with 86 different, uh, different data structures for each neuron, each of which might be in principle represented separately in the computer's memory somewhere. So there'll be physical components and physical locations corresponding to every neuron. And then it's not too hard to imagine the uh, silicon system, you know, originally three-dimensionally arranged in a head morphing into some arrangement like that on a circuit board. Now, a lot's gonna make a difference. Is it a parallel computer? Is it a serial computer? If it's serial, will everything have to go through a CPU? And there's gonna be some small differences there, but I guess I'd argue for continuity between the two. But you know, there are people who argue that that's, that stuff really matters. For example, Giulio Tononi and Christoph Koch, uh, who advocate the information integration theory of consciousness. They think if you do it, in the serial way through a von Neumann bottleneck, a central processing unit, then you won't get consciousness. Whereas you do it in, if you do it in the fully parallel way, then you will get consciousness. I'm skeptical about that, but if we don't understand consciousness, it is possible that all these, these details of how, how things are arranged could make a difference. So let me quickly ask my last question and then I'll take, uh, we'll bring Tim in. So my last question concerned value. You talk about how, uh, in virtual reality, our lives could be just as good and just as meaningful as in physical reality, at least if it's the case that virtual reality becomes advanced enough that um, we could have the same experiences. Um, and if we're imagining a virtual world that's social, that involves interactions with other people as well. And in, the, uh, in your introduction, you brought up the famous experience fishing thought experiment um, by Robert Notzig. And I guess I wanted to ask about just what you think uh, about other philosophers' views on this. So you and David Bourget ran the recent 2020 Phil Paper survey that um, surveyed a bunch of professional philosophers on their views on various philosophical questions. And one of the most uh, unpopular ideas is that one should enter the experience machine. Uh, if one had the choice. So only 13% of the target respondents said that they would enter the experience machine. And I guess I was just wondering, what do you make of this data? Uh, do you think that these philosophers are wrong? Do you think that they're misimagining the scenario in some way? Do you think there's just fundamental differences in our intuitions about welfare in this case? Yeah, great, uh, great question. And uh, I should say that uh... For those of you who don't know, Andrew Lee is one of the world's leading experts on the connection between consciousness and value. He's written some really, really good, uh, good papers on this topic, exploring actually, so <laughs> Andrew's explored some of these issues in more depth than, uh, than I have. But actually on the experience machine, you know, Nozick used that to argue that more than consciousness matters because the experience machine has the same consciousness as us, but its life is not as good. I guess I actually agree. With, uh, with Nozick and with the 73% of people here. When I took the survey, I said, I would not enter the experience machine. 
And the reason is that uh, the experience machine, as Nozick describes it, is basically pre-programmed. It's pre-scripted. You live out a script of, you know, who's to say, becoming a successful philosopher, publishing a book, having a good life with good relationships, but it's all just a script playing out and you don't actually do any of it. Um, so, you know, I accept Nozick's intuition that in that scenario, I wouldn't really genuinely be doing things. I wouldn't have genuine autonomy. I really care about that. I guess I'd just say that in VR, that's not how things are. People who enter virtual worlds, typically, even in a virtual world like Second Life, you've got full scale free world, you've got autonomous choices. It's absolutely not pre-scripted, pre-programmed. You get to uh, build your own life, build your own relationship. So I would say that entering VR, entering the experience machine are really quite different here. And those objections to the experience machine don't apply nearly as well to VR. Now, of course, we didn't on the survey ask people, would you be willing to enter, say, VR for the rest of your life? Look, I fully expect that if we had if we'd asked people that, we would have had the we would have had more than 13% say yes. 13% uh, said they'd enter the experience machine. Who knows? Maybe 30% would have entered VR. Maybe another 60% would have said uh, would have said no. And look, I do think there are probably people. There are obviously a lot of people out there for whom the possibility of life in VR seems unattractive, dystopian. Then I think, what is the disagreement in those cases? I think some of them are making philosophical mistakes because they're thinking, okay, all this is an illusion when in fact it's not an illusion or meaningless when it's not. Others might just be expressing a preference, in which case I'd say, fine, there's, you know, there's a, I think it's perfectly reasonable to prefer living in a natural world as opposed to a, uh, a virtual world. But if I had to guess, as time goes along in the, uh, in the 21st century, um, I would predict, I would like my, my optimistic hypothesis is that uh, perhaps people will become more open to uh, living in a virtual world. By the way, I've seen this already happen with the uh, extended mind hypothesis that, that somehow you know, the tools we use like our smartphones constitute part of our minds. Back in the mid nineties, uh, everyone thought it was crazy. It was a ridiculous speculative, uh, hypothesis was very hard to believe. Now in the 2020 full papers survey, we have more than 50% of philosophers saying they accept the extended mind thesis. So I do think these, uh, these attitudes can change over time. I suspect the, these attitudes will change as well as people interact with VR more and more. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think this is a good time to bring in Tim. Uh, so uh, maybe Tim can enter the discussion and um, I'll open it up to Tim to ask Dave some questions and I'll moderate. Thanks, Andrew. Thank, thanks very much. And, um, and thanks, Dave. Thanks for your introduction and, uh, and for this terrific book. I have to say, you know, this is really quite unusual, this book, there it is. You can see it's very, it's very big, this book. It's 500 pages. There are very few, 500 page books in philosophy that it is actually possible to read. I can tell you that now. I've tried to read some of them. Normally 500 page books are the sort of books you say, you know, in the footnote you say, oh, for a few of this kind, see such and such. You know? But this book is a book that you can, act, it's absolutely readable. And it's really, it's a great achievement. You've managed to introduce lots of problems of philosophy. You also, um, and while also advancing this um, thesis, uh, about virtual reality and virt the virtual worlds are real, um, which of course is incredibly implausible. And and you know and and we're <laughs> and you haven't persuaded me at all. But you know I'm a skeptic about these things. And and um, but you know you made me read the book, and it's so it's great. Um, so I d I just want to ask about so something you say. You make a lot of the reality of virtual reality, by which I mean the fact that it's changed so much since you first used to used to play it on your foot you first used to play computer games when when you were a kid um and you often say you know it's likely that within some decades or we will have perfect simulations or near perfect simulations and things so i want to know how serious you are about that kind of empirical claim um because presumably it would involve um making huge leaps in in uh, the study of AI, for example, because you would have to have in the virtual worlds, you would have to interact not just with inanimate objects, but with people who were indistinguishable from, 
from real people. So you'd have conversations with with real people. So you'll have to solve the Turing test and pass the, yeah, the machine will have to pass the Turing test and everything. And and I wonder to what extent you think your metaphysical thesis about the nature of reality depends on the progress that actual AI is going to make. Can I just yeah. Another, yeah, if I could just add add one thing. I mean, because mm. another another way to think of it is we are physical beings, and in principle, it's possible to to replicate every aspect of our physical existence. Um, but that's not what you're saying. I mean, you do say you do say things like that at certain points in the book. Um, what what to what extent are you relying on basic on the idea of computation AI as opposed to the mere idea that we could replicate something? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a philosopher, not a not a technologist, nor a scientist, nor an engineer. Um, so you know, you shouldn't take you certainly shouldn't take me too seriously on timelines. If I say something's going to happen in ten or twenty years or fifty or a hundred years, you know, I'm not a I'm not going to be a real, an especially reliable source on on those matters. But you know, but I do think it's important. You know, the more important philosophical question might be whether certain things will be possible eventually or in principle. I mean, if it's not possible in principle to build, say, a computer simulation of a human brain, then at least certain versions of the simulation hypothesis are going to, uh, are themselves going to be impossible to realize. And if we can know that's impossible, then we could rule out certain scenarios. But I guess, so one way to think about an underlying assumption here is that say, the human brain is itself a physical machine running on physical principles that are themselves can be simulated algorithmically, arbitrarily, closely. And as far as we know right now, it looks like the laws of physics can be, uh, can be simulated algorithmically. Some people like Roger Penrose are inclined to deny it and they say maybe there's something non-computable in physics. That would make all this a bit trickier, but even then I would, I would think if, even if there's something say non-computable in physics, then ultimately maybe a new kind of computer ought to be able to exploit that, that special computing power uh, for a new kind of simulation. I suppose if it turns out that, that a form of dualism is true where the mind has causal powers on the brain that are fundamentally non-mechanistic, uh, can't be expressible in any simple, any straightforward mathematical laws at all, then, then at that point all bets would be off. And I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about that kind of view. I take seriously right. the idea of various forms of dualism, but I'd like to think that they would, uh, that the, uh, the causal powers of the mind here could still be in principle simulated fairly well. But you know, I may be wrong about that. And that's one of the ways these arguments can go wrong. And in the, in the chapter where I talk about how seriously we should take the simulation hypothesis, there are various things called sim blockers that, that I talk about which would actually get in the way. And this is and this is certainly one of them. And I give it some, yeah, I give it some probability, which is why at one point I say, yeah, okay, I'm at least 50% on simulated minds being possible. But you know, but for the reason partly for the reasons you're giving, I'm not at uh, I'm not at hundred percent. That's interesting, because I mean that suggests that I mean what See, AI doesn't proceed by creating a simulation of the human brain. So AI proceeds by having a task and the task and then, then tries to create computational devices that will complete that task. Um, and I suppose what, some of the obstacles that you can see to what you know, people in AI called artificial general intelligence, which is opposed to, as opposed to playing games or, or um, you know, um, re reading text or translation or these things, um, the obstacles that they have are in specifying what the task is that people are actually doing. So they start with a high level task like communication. You know, what's, what's the task of communication? What is it for? How would you design something that can communicate? And I think it, it's fair to say that actually in AI, no one has any idea how to do that. But you're thinking now in a different way from the way you put it, which so, I mean, if, if the pro project of creating simulation rested on the idea of something like AI as it is now, or something like virtual reality, 
machines as, as they are now, then these would be real questions. These could be sim blockers. You know, if you said, um, you know, we couldn't ever have a communication with a machine. Right? But it sounds like your assumption is more the idea that the brain, if you, you can start with a simulation of the actual human brain, the brain is just a physical mechanism. And then the only thing that could be a sim blocker at that point was whether you could have a computer simulation of the human brain. Is that is that right, would you say? I guess I was thinking that simulations of brains are especially relevant here because we're thinking about the possibility that a simulation might have experiences just like mine. But, right. um, and then it seems like, but then, of course, there's a very wide class of possible artificial intelligences, and I think it's very likely that many of those could be conscious too, but I think it would be unlikely they'd have experiences like mine. I mentioned already, you know, the, the Oracle versus Trinity. If the Oracle is an AI produced by fundamentally different principles from the way Trinity's brain is produced, then I think it's might, uh, the Oracle might still well be conscious, but probably conscious in a, uh, in a different way. So I guess I was just thinking of the, the simulation path or the brain emulation path is just one possible path to artificial general intelligence. There's also evolutionary methods. By far the most common right now is machine learning and yeah, transformer models are now beginning to show at least some somewhat greater degree of generality of capacities than, uh, than was possible 10 years ago. But of course, yeah, we're still very, very far off anything like artificial general intelligence through these yeah. paths. But yeah, I wouldn't expect those paths, machine learning, evolution to produce something, especially human-like. Okay, good. So that, that, makes, that brings me to my second question really, which is what the, what the virtual reality talk in the book really adds to the Cartesian um, uh, idea. Um, because in the Cartesian idea, as you say in the book, actually, that you know, Descartes didn't didn't tell you how the whole thing worked. You know, how's the demon? What is this demon? What's it made of? You know, and, and I I remember when I was a first a student and in the, when I was a PhD student in Cambridge, and and I mentioned something in in a seminar where, and I said, well, what if you were deceived by an evil demon? And the professor uh, Hugh Meller he said, I don't believe in demons. And I thought. What's that got to do with it? What's believing in demons got to do with it? It's just a device, right? Um, and if you're running a skeptical argument like this, you don't have to spell it out. You don't have to be. De Descartes didn't have to spell out what the demon was doing. Uh, but you, I think, I, I thought that part of the point of the VR thing was that you could spell it out a bit more. Um, but now what you say in response is that, well, it's going to be a simulation of some kind. And all I mean here is something where you could recreate the, the experience of interacting with other people or a world, however it's done. And isn't that then a little bit more, just doesn't really add that much to Descartes' scenario? Yeah. I guess I was thinking of more than just recreating the, uh, the experience. I mean, specifically what I had in mind was something like a computer simulation of physical processes, uh, yes, in the brain, but also, also out there in the world. And then I would argue that, uh, that something that involved that kind of simulation of the physical processes in the brain and elsewhere would then give you duplication of experience. So I'd say, you know, the simulation idea is playing a more central role here than in, yeah, Descartes, Descartes just says, we're gonna give you the experiences, who knows how, how it's done. Here is actually a somewhat concrete way of doing this, which is furthermore an extension from things we have now. Not so much, I'm not so much thinking of AI technology as, Simulation technology, which is you know huge in so many fields, and yeah, right now simulation is done piecemeal. We do have cosmological simulations and planetary simulations and social simulations, but they're they're piecemeal. But I think there's you know yeah. well, pretty why, well, decent said, reason. Yeah, go on. Why I said the experience is important is because it's very important that you can't distinguish between that someone experiencing one of these. Yeah, things. can't distinguish between the simulation and the real thing, whereas you know, as you mentioned, in, I think you discussed Dan Dennett's thing about the hurricanes in the book. Yeah. Know, simulation models of hurricanes don't get you wet, you know, but um, real hurricanes do. So that's why I said experience is important. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And I so, would argue that in these, go on. Go on. Well, I, I just, I, then I wanted to just follow on about Descartes, actually, because one of the novel things in the book is that you actually, you, I thought at first you would try and make some distinction between the VR reality being real, genuine reality 
and Descartes' evil demon reality uh, not being a genuine reality. But in fact, you kind of bite the bullet on this one. You say, actually, Descartes is what, what Descartes has shown is that reality, or his, what, here's one way to read Descartes, reality is very different from what we think it is, which is your view, uh, if the simulation is, um, if, if, if virtual reality, if we are really living in a simulation, then reality is very different from what we think it is. Um, so that, and that makes me think, well, what was the question Descartes was asking then? Can you actually pose that question within your framework about how wrong can we be about the world? Um, because it turns out that the scenario Descartes describes is actually consistent with being right about the world. It's just that the world is very different from what we think it is. The world is a, is a bunch of things being done by a demon, or in your case, it's a bunch of bits. You know? How do we actually how do we actually formulate the skeptical question given your um give, given your thesis that virtual reality is reality? Yeah, well, I guess I think of the relevant skeptical question as one about our ordinary beliefs about the external world around us. That you know there are tables and chairs and bookshelves over there. That, I'm in New York City that has uh, you know, these buildings and I'm talking to some people uh, right now and there's Tim Crane, and there's Andrew Lee and uh, you know, all those ordinary beliefs about the world. And I think of the Cartesian skeptical arguments as cast, potentially casting doubt, as attempting to cast doubt on those beliefs by producing a scenario where if that scenario is actual, then those beliefs are false. And then the thought is, if I can't know that that scenario is not actual, um, those beliefs then won't constitute knowledge. So my, res so my response to that, uh, you know, partly by thinking about this idea that simulations, you know, needn't be illusions, is that even if we, for at least some of these Cartesian scenarios, let's take the simulation hypothesis. If we're in the simulation hypothesis, if the simulation hypothesis is true, then whereas a Cartesian might say, yeah, that means that there are no tables and chairs over there and so on. In fact, I'm gonna say if the simulation is hypothesis is true, there are still tables and chairs and planets and people and all those ordinary beliefs are in fact true. So in that respect, the world is as I thought it was. It's true that in some more theoretical and esoteric respects, the world is not as I thought it was. That for example, yeah, it turns out there's a, there's a creator and all this is running on a computer and it's all digital. I might not have known it was digital. So yeah, so the world has a nature that goes beyond what I thought. That's not so different in principle from, for example, the world being quantum mechanical. The world has some further nature that goes beyond what I thought. I may actually be wrong about some things. Like I might've thought that a certain level was the fundamental level and, and no, it's not. But I think what matters for ordinary skepticism is the status of our ordinary beliefs rather than these more esoteric beliefs so you're much more like Barclay in this respect then because who defended all our ordinary beliefs and there are tables and chairs and cats and dogs and um but um there are the nate that the, on the theoretical level you have to understand that these things are really ideas in the mind of god and this is like your view that of course there are tables and chairs and ordinary people but at the theoretical level we say these things assuming that we are in a simulation these things are actually their real nature is so and so yeah there's definitely a parallel to to Berkeley and I think of you know what idealism plays a certain role for for Berkeley and potentially vindicating uh our ordinary beliefs I'm not an idealist but I think roughly speaking a form of structuralism can play a similar role um yeah, yeah. okay good um did Perhaps I could ask the last question, if that's okay, Andrew. Then, to, which, and then I think there's going to be general Q and A. Um, yeah, I think the timing will be perfect. So go ahead. So this leads me on to my last point, which is actually um, something I think you worry about. You worried about it in um, the original paper on this the matrix as metaphysics, um, which is the thing Andrew mentioned, which is other people and what other people are, and um, and of course Berkeley. For other pe other people were not ideas in the minds of God. Other people were souls. So it's not true that everything is an idea in the mind of God because the soul, the, the others are actual 
people, <laughs> they're something special, their substances, their souls in themselves. So um, I think many people would have this reaction. And I think there's the something you said in the matrix of metaphysics that I, that I remember where you say, um, you know, it might be all okay to think, you know, your steak or your food or your bed or something. These are just products of the computer program. But the idea that your your friends, your conscious, um, the people you know, the conscious people you know are just products of the computer program is somewhat hard, harder to accept. Um, so I suppose I want to ask, how do you stand on this, really? I mean, what's your real feeling about this? I mean, because it's really, you know, the, the, the idea that your partner or, or your mother might be very, very different from what you think they are, not in the sense that, you know, your, your partner doesn't come from Brazil or that your mother is in, in Australia, but rather that they're actually products of the computer program, right? Um, this, this is surely impossible to believe, surely, to take seriously as an idea. I don't know. Um, you know, if you told me that uh, my partner is a quantum mechanical process, I'd probably, I'd likewise find this, yeah, difficult to believe and counterintuitive. But I don't know that the simulation idea is uh, is worse. Um, I mean, of course, there is this significant philosophical problem of other minds. And if I did discover that my partner was not even conscious, then that would be kind of shocking. It's like, yeah, my partner, gosh, if my partner turns out to be a philosophical zombie then that's certainly uh, very shocking. Has not been, she has not actually been experiencing any of this. This is, this has not had a, I would say then that maybe this has not really had genuine meaning or value. Yeah, but that's, that, that's, that's, that would be shocking. That's a skeptical hypothesis. And I don't think we're supposed to yeah. take those seriously in the same yeah. way. I mean, this is why, whereas the, the radical thing about your book is that you're putting forward um, virtual reality as reality, not as a skeptical hypothesis, but as a, as a, Right. something that could be credible for you about what reality is. Right. So if I think about the, uh, the yeah, I guess in my view, yeah, inside a, say, a perfect simulation of the physical universe, there would actually be conscious beings um, supported by that simulation. So if I, insofar as I take the simulation hypothesis seriously, the version of it that says, yeah, I'm part of the simulation, uh, you're a part of the simulation, my partner is part of the simulation. Then, yeah, if I accepted that, I'd come to think, um, for me, it wouldn't be that. I mean, yeah, sure, all of us are digital beings, and that's going to be sort of new and counterintuitive and take some getting used to. And the fact that this was all created by simulators would also take some getting loose to. It might change some things around. But I'm not sure I see those things as being different in principle from, say, first discovering that all this is quantum mechanical, Second, discovering that all this was created by a God in the next universe up, so to speak. Yeah, the fact that all this was the product of someone's agency, well, that's certainly weird and would, uh, would take some getting used to. And likewise, the fact that all this is digital, but it wouldn't make me, <laughs> make me suddenly uh, you know, look at my partner and say, oh my God, you alien creature, you, it's any more than, well, Maybe you, we all have this reaction. I have this reaction occasionally to scientific hypotheses like quantum mechanics. Oh my gosh, the whole world is an alien place and that and the we are all very different from what we thought. But I personally don't find myself having that reaction uh, to a greater extent where the simulation hypothesis is concerned. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. Thanks a lot, well, I think Sam, this will be. I think this is a good time to turn to the Q&A. So what um, I guess I'll do is I'll read questions. And uh, I think most of them are mainly directed towards Dave, but Tim, feel free to answer as well. Uh, I think all these questions are fairly open. And I'm going to start with uh, two questions that are fairly related to each other. So Karen Bester asks, uh, currently, we can't smell a virtual glass of wine or taste a virtual hamburger, but you say these are temporary limitations. In the future, would that also mean that you could get drunk on virtual wine or nourish your simulated body with a virtual burger? And then relatedly, Naomi Shemin asks, current VR is only very thinly immersive. The jump to including touch, smell, taste, kinesthesia, proprioception, um, et cetera, is enormous. This whole approach is so brain-centric as though our experience of embodiment 
uh, always goes through the brain, an updated version of the mind-body split, what happens when we take full embodiment seriously? Yeah, these are these are great questions. And I mean, absolutely, the role of the body is, is crucial. And the bodily senses are probably the single biggest limitation of, uh, of current VR. It's quite good with, uh, with vision and audition, um, but uh, yeah, bodily senses, proprioception, hunger, thirst, touch, and so on, uh, not handled well at all, usually even not handled at all. Now there are people who are working on these things, the so-called haptic technology industry, but it's still extremely um, still extremely primitive. I actually had to have a, I had a lunch with a journalist over the weekend. The proposal was for us to have a, you know, to, to have a lunch inside virtual reality. And the question arose, how do you actually have lunch inside virtual reality? So we found a, um, a, uh, a room containing, uh, a virtual room containing virtual sushi, uh, where you go through the motions of eating virtual sushi in the virtual room, of course. Doing that is not at all nourishing, and it doesn't make your uh, doesn't make your hunger go away. So simultaneously, in the physical world, we had some physical sushi, and the way it worked was after eating some virtual sushi in the virtual world, then proceed to eat some eat a piece of physical sushi in the physical world. But that's very much a, a cheat, of course. Yeah, eating is not right now a good use case for VR. But yeah, um, but in the long run, uh, what could be what could be possible here? I guess. Um, one set of breakthroughs might come when we have brain computer interfaces that could, uh, where some aspects of the mind will interface with, uh, sorry, some aspects of the virtual world will be directly hooked in to areas of the brain responsible for the body, uh, possibly giving you, you know, simulated senses of touch or proprioception by dealing with the, uh, by dealing with the, uh, the body image. I mean, the, yeah, the question gets gets raised. I think Naomi raised the question of, well, why well, think the brain is doing everything here? Maybe, um, maybe the body is actually super important uh, in, say, the bodily senses, independent of its effect on the brain. And these correspond to yeah, two different hypotheses about embodiment. One is that you know you can capture most of the effects of embodiment by dealing with, say, body images in the brain. And the second says, no, you actually need to handle the body. I guess if, we, if we're looking to the far future, we can move to a far future where both the brain and the body are simulated. And insofar as the body plays certain key roles in, in the, the actual body plays key, key roles in the bodily senses, I guess I would try to extend the arguments that a simulated brain could produce the same kind of experiences as a biological brain, I'd, I'd try to extend those arguments to the body plus the brain, that simulated body plus the brain could do the, uh, could do the same. Now, somebody might want, to, uh, want to, uh, to argue there that there's something special about the body. I actually think that already people are finding that digital bodies can do amazing things. I mean, many of the phenomena of embodied cognition can be found to some extent in, uh, in virtual reality with avatars. People feel a very strong attachment to their, uh, to their avatars, their they can express uh, identity through their, through their avatars. Uh, their avatars can show interesting perceptual effects. So I would, you know, I think it's not out of the question that, that digital uh, embodiment could end up being in certain respects continuous with physical embodiment. But yeah, these are, these are very good questions. Okay, so Juan Alvarez asks, in other philosophical fields, people also talk about simulations. Some discussions on, for example, mind reading, memory, mental time travel, appeal to the notion in order to account for those phenomena. And my question is pretty naive. Is your discussion on simulations applicable or compatible with those discussions? Could we, for example, advance discussions on say memory by applying your view on simulations? Um, yeah, the idea of simulation is such a rich one that I don't want to say that I'm somehow putting forward a definitive or exhaustive work on simulation and all the roles that it uh, that it plays. Yeah, I first ran into uh, the idea of simulation and philosophy of mind via the simulation theory of other minds that we come to and know about other people's minds by by simulating them 
Now, of course, simulations have just become so central in science that philosophers of science have thought about them, um, have thought about them left and right. I'm just trying to call up this, uh, this question. Um, just see what exactly the question was. Or maybe it's gone from the Q&A now because you, Andrew, can yeah, you explain think, exactly what the question was? Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, let me try to pull it up. I mean, I think the question was basically about how your discussion of simulations relates to uh, invocations of simulations in other philosophical and other theoretical fields. Uh, for example, discussions in memory as one um, case in point. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of some mental processes as simulations is super important. I mean, one obvious example is dreaming, which is a giant, uh, giant simulation, but also the imagination is frequently, um, is often naturally understood as a kind of simulation process. And one interesting question, of course, that arises here is if I want to say simulations are real, does this mean I have to say that dreams are real or that what happens in imagination is somehow as real as the physical world? And then I want to say, well, yes, well, yes, and more deeply, no, um, not least these mental simulations are mind dependent. They're going on within one's mind. So that fails one of the key elements on the reality checklist. And I'd also, some simulations are more scripted than others. And so they may end up having less rich causal powers. But that said, I've actually, since the book came out, I've been contacted by a couple of groups of psychiatrists who are interested in thinking about things like uh, schizophrenia, uh, delusions and hallucinations in patients with uh, different form, different mental disorders, and are wondering whether some of these ideas about virtual worlds could be uh, could be usable. And I'm, I'm open to that. I'm open to that. I wouldn't want to, to overclaim that this is going to revolutionize uh, various other fields. But yeah, I talked to some, some architects yesterday who are interested in uh, the use of virtual worlds in architecture and found some ideas here helpful. So I think, yeah, I, I, I hope that there end up being, uh, being some useful connections to draw here, but I don't claim to have given thorough analyses of those domains myself yet. Dave, if I could just step in briefly, if you, if you think that the, the, the dreams fail to be re real um, because of the mind, in, because they fail the mind independence criteria, and then um, then you might want to say the same thing about the evil demon. Supposing the evil demon was a, a pure spirit, and you know, the evil demon was giving you all these ideas, uh, and even if it's a more perfect simulation than a dream, it would still fail the reality test. So I don't know. I just think of the comparison between you and Descartes. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess I think of the worst kind of mind dependence is dependence on one's own mind. You know, if one, if one not being able to get one, one, one at least wants to get outside one's own mind with reality. If something is not outside one's own mind, then it fails the reality checklist particularly badly. I guess I'm thinking that being constituted by someone else's mind is at least a a, a step above that, uh, even if it's not, even if it's it's still dependent on the mind. Of course, the same thing will go for God's mind on a Barclay-like scenario. Barclay's reality is mind dependent. Too. But I guess, yeah, I would, I guess I would argue that being constituted by processes in someone else's mind is uh, at least closer to what we, uh, what we hope for from reality than being constituted by processes in one's own mind. So here's a fun question from Martin Steenhagen. He asks, what do you think are the opportunities for virtual things to move from their virtual world into the real, real world or the physical world? Uh, think of Agent Smith spe stepping out of the matrix into the reality in which the human race lies incubated, for example. Yeah, well, actually, no spoilers, but uh, if you watch Matrix Resurrections, there is a, uh, there is a scene in which a uh, character that had previously been purely virtual gets to take on board a, uh, a physical embodiment and a kind of physical body involving weird magnetic ball bearings that mirror its uh, physical shape. So... Yeah, like this is, um, I think this is certainly possible in, in principle. I mean, you can already do this with, say, a video game, and you've got a little algorithm that's controlling a, uh, a digital body inside a simulated physical world in a, uh, in a video game. You can at least attempt to take that algorithm and put it inside a robotic body in the, uh, in the physical world and see, uh, and, 
and see how it does and whether um, the same algorithm might be used to control a digital body and a uh, and a physical body. So yeah, that's certainly possible at least where you know agents are concerned. But yeah, you know what you've got to do is combine virtual reality and three D printing. Maybe someone will be able to take say some rocks and some treasures from a virtual world and find a way to and give them some instantiation in the physical world. At that point, they may, those may be no longer algorithmic. They might just be lumps of stuff that that uh, that don't do as much, but yeah, I think there are there are lots of possibilities there. And yeah, if you want to use that to create red pills, I mean, people do entertain the idea that if we're in a simulation, maybe uh, this gives rise to the possibility of certain forms of life after death because the simulators could take code from um, code from the simulation and embody it in other virtual worlds or perhaps even in a in a non virtual world. And I mean, it's all science fiction, but those are I don't see why those those things are ruled out in principle. There's a couple related questions that concern the notion of control. So Niku uh, Aghai asks, could another distinction between the real world and the virtual world be the extent of control one has over one's experience? And then Jumana Kokache asks, if you enter somewhere that you know has been created and is controlled by someone else, does it still count as reality? Video games don't seem like reality, nor does Working, working in an overly bureaucratic environment. Uh, in both situations, you follow the rules to achieve goals, but uh, it doesn't seem like a real experience. So is it necessary to be unaware that you're in a controlled environment in order to accept it as reality? Boy, yeah, it's a good question. I think it's, you know, I think there are cases and cases here. Certain forms of control are acceptable to us and certain forms of control are, um, or not. If it turns out that everything we do is being massively manipulated constantly, then that's a that's a dystopian scenario. If we think we're making free choices, we've actually been manipulated into uh, into every choice by I don't know an evil neuroscientist or by advertising in our environment and so on. Then I'd say no, we don't have the autonomy that we thought we had, and we really value autonomy. And the same goes for you know virtual worlds are controlled by corporations or constantly manipulating us, then that's going to be even more dystopian than, you know, you think social media where your newsfeed is manipulated is bad, your whole world is manipulated, then that's especially bad. But there are forms of control, you know, if all this, if on the other hand, you know, God just set up the laws of physics and then watch this go, that's a form of control without constant interference. Um, I think many people think that's consistent with a degree of autonomy. I mean, of course, there are people who think even that degree of control and determinism underlines, undermines free will, but I wouldn't go, uh, I wouldn't go that far. So I guess it kind of depends on the, uh, on the extent of the control of the environment. If it's just some background parameters that are set up, then I think that's going to be consistent with a fair amount of autonomy. If it's, uh, if it's really control over your every action, then that's, uh, then that's less good. And there are also interesting questions about your awareness of the, uh, of the control. Is it necessary to be unaware you're in a controlled environment to accept it as reality? Well, I don't know. I do think that if you're in one of those badly controlled and manipulated environments, and even if you're unaware of the manipulation, it's still bad. I think you know that's in a certain sense. That's closer to Nozick's experience machine. In Nozick's experience machine, you don't actually know you're in the experience machine, I take it, but we still think that's, uh, that's bad, partly because of the control and the, and the manipulation. Yeah, so, so, and the other, the first question was, could the distinction between the real world and virtual world be the extent of the control? Well, I guess I would like to think that virtual worlds are consistent with the same amount of control one has in the real world. I mean, yeah, you get to choose your environment to some extent, and, but you can do that in the, uh, in the physical world too. So you get a certain amount of control, but there's also room for things to evolve freely. You hang out in a virtual community and with other people and life can be unpredictable and uncontrolled in a virtual world, just as it is in the physical world. OK, another question from Sui Khan. Uh, so Sui asks, my question is about the relation between realities. If VR is as real as our ordinary physical reality, then what kind of relations should hold between ordinary reality and other simulated realities? Do you believe that they should be uh, there should be some kind of hierarchy? or are they equal? Um, thank you. 
There are various ways, interesting question. There are various ways to impose hierarchies here. I mean, you can have a hierarchy ordered by what creates what, for example. Um, you know, maybe there's a level zero unsimulated world in which many simulated worlds are created and those will then be at level one. And maybe within some of those simulated worlds, further simulations will be created and those will be level two and so on. And that's a way of putting all this into a uh, into an ordered hierarchy. I would say they're all equally real. So it's not a hierarchy of anything like degrees of reality, but it might still reflect the order of creation. It might also reflect an order of fundamentality that the base world is the most fundamental and these other worlds are all realized within the base world. So that's one kind of, of hierarchy. Are they metaphysically equal? I do wanna say whether they're equal with respect to reality, but that doesn't mean they're metaphysically the same. They, um, yeah, one of them, the base world may be fundamental. The other one may be realized in some complex way. The other one may be realized in a more complex way. We're probably gonna to want to make all kinds of metaphysical distinctions between them. I just resist the idea of saying they differ in their, in their reality, one being real and the other one, and, uh, and the other one not. I mean, the, there is this notion of reality. Sometimes we use, we say a real thing is the original thing. If something's a copy, it's not real. You, certainly with the Mona Lisa, you'd say, you know, the original Mona Lisa is real, a copy is, is not real. That's maybe a derivative sense of reality, which I think isn't quite so crucial, but in, in that one sense, maybe that's the one sense of reality in which you might be able to say the simulated worlds are not real because they're, they're, they're in a certain sense copies or simulations. But I take that to be a somewhat marginal sense of reality myself. I wanna make sure that Tim has an opportunity for each of these questions. Did you wanna say anything on this question, Tim? Uh, you, you're, not on that okay. one, not, not on that one, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so here's another question uh, from Ari M. O'Malley. Uh, my, their question is with regards to the foundations of Dave's thesis about the nature of reality, and in particular, whether you see this as primarily an empirical issue or a conceptual issue. Oh, it's complicated. It's probably a mix of, uh, of both. I mean, partly there are many different theses here. I mean, take the thesis that Take the simulation hypothesis itself. Is that an empirical thesis or a, not exactly a conceptual thesis? It's a substantive thesis about reality. It might be one that's hard to resolve empirically though. I mean, take the, the, maybe we could never get evidence demonstrating the perfect simulation hypothesis or disproving it. If so, it's not a scientific thesis, but it's also not a conceptual thesis. I don't think it's something we could settle by reflecting on our concepts. I would see that as a substantive thesis about reality that may be, may be impossible to resolve through conceptual or empirical means, but we can, reason, we can reason about using the tools of philosophy. The more general thesis that you know, if we're in a simulation, uh, everything is perfectly real. That's to some extent a conceptual thesis got by reflecting on our ordinary concepts and on our concept of reality. Although at different points, empirical results come in. I start, at various points, I start saying, well, this is at least as real as physical reality is according to say quantum mechanics, relativity, string theory. And that's actually using empirical theses in the background. And maybe there are ways the physical world could have turned out. So the physical reality looked more like, you know, what I call the garden of Eden. Uh, and, uh, and then simulated reality would look worse by comparison to that. So I guess it basically ends up being a complex mix of empirical and conceptual issues. Of course, I'm not myself uh, doing, doing experiments on this or even drawing that directly on, on experiments, but I do think empirical knowledge of existing technology does actually play a central role in some of these arguments. I should also say uh, for Tim, if if you want to interject on any question, just unmute your mic and then I'll go to you. Uh, and otherwise I'll just keep moving forward. Um, so there's a question from uh, Aisha Kadus as a stand-in for Harry Goldborn. They ask, in relation to the point concerning 
how much this thesis is predicated on the in principle possibility of perfect simulations. The underlying structures of computation seem to have strict limitations, for example, halting problems for Turing machines. And this might give one reason to think that there are things experienced by physical agents that could not be produced or computed at a bottom level of the simulation and therefore could not be simulated at the higher level. Do you have any thoughts on how your view might be impacted by in principle uncomputability? Uncom in other words, are there limits to computation that might um, impinge on how we think about these sorts of issues? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mentioned Penrose's view earlier that maybe there are uncomputable processes in physics, say in quantum mechanics or quantum gravity, which he thinks might play a role in human brain functioning. Of course, that's very controversial and I'm somewhat skeptical, but yeah, just say Penrose is right, that there are, uh, there's something uncomputable in physical reality. I guess I'd like to think that in principle, we could then take that physical, that uncomputable physical process and bottle it, so to speak, for a new form of computer, maybe a quantum gravity computer that uses, uh, uses those processes and is able to compute things that could not be computed by classical machines. And if that's possible, then it's possible that that kind of, that new, computer technology could be used to build a new kind of simulation of physical processes uh, that went beyond the Turing computable. Um, of course, this is all very speculative now because we don't know of any physical processes that are not Turing computable. But if we found them, I suspect that all, just as we found a way to exploit quantum mechanical processes for quantum computers, that we might ultimately be able to exploit these new uncomputable processes to compute things that were previously uncomputable. Um, okay, so uh, Olga A asks, how are you saying that, uh, how is what you're saying different from a good old theory of the creator? How is this different from the kinds of um, assertions that are made by different religions? Very simple uh, and basic question. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because there are some structural elements, say, in the simulation hypothesis that look somewhat reminiscent of theistic views. I mean, this world is in a certain sense created. When the simulator sets up the simulation, they're in a certain sense bringing this world into existence. And arguably they have at least, a, they can in principle, I don't know if they're all powerful and all knowing, but the simulator, simulators can at least know an awful lot and have an awful lot of control over the worlds they create. So those are some of the properties of a traditional God. On the other hand, not much reason to think that the simulator is all good or all wise. Certainly, I don't see a whole lot of reason to create any kind of religion around this uh, this simulator. I don't think the simulator, um, you know, has any special insight into how we live, how we should live our lives, or into a, into our ethical. I don't think we should orient our ethical practices around them. So. I don't know, I would not, I, and I certainly think, most fundamentally, I think we certainly shouldn't worship a, a simulator. I don't know to what extent worship is traditional in all central religions, but insofar as it is, I'd say uh, that's one very key property of a, of a God that I'd say that the, uh, the simulator lacks. So yeah, I wouldn't try, so I wouldn't try and erect a, a religion around the simulator, but there are interesting parallels with theistic notions. Can I just jump in at that point, David, and ask a direct question? I mean, you said you weren't an idealist earlier on, but um, but why not? If you think that the simulation hypothesis is that's one hypothesis about how things could be, supposing it was correct, would you be? What, why aren't you an idealist? I guess I'd think that if the simulation hypothesis is correct, there's still no special reason to think the world is made of made of mind. Rather physical processes out there are realized by digital processes, which are maybe running on a computer in the next universe up, but there's no particular role. Um, but in my mind, it's the, uh, it's the causal structure of those computational processes that realize and make real physical reality, not experiences inside someone's mind. And there's a version of this where the computer itself is say running inside God's mind. Then you basically have Barclay with, uh, with um, yeah, God having a very rich mind that mirrors the structure of physical reality. And 
Um, yeah, or maybe it's an evil demon or a simulator with a very complex mind that's running all this. So there could be versions of this where all the structure is realized by mind, but I don't see why it, uh, why it has to be. The idealist, there were two parts of the idealist thing, and you mentioned this in the book. I mean, one is that the idea that things are made of minds, things are really made of minds. I can see you're not saying that, but the other bit is that there isn't a gap in a certain way between appearance and reality. That there isn't the sort of gap that um, a skeptic thinks there is, um, a, a global skeptic, because it turns out that, uh, that, these, that these beliefs that the global skeptic thinks are false are actually just uh, true beliefs about things that have a very different nature. Uh, and that's the bit that's like Barclay. Yeah, yeah I, I, I guess I want a somewhat wider gap between appearance and reality than the, the idealist has. I do want to try to argue that certain global gaps are not as wide as they could be, but it's not even that I rule out the possibility of a being for whom all the appearances are the same, but the reality is different. Towards the end of the book, I talk about so-called Boltzmann brains that randomly come into existence, at least for a short period, have experience as of an ordinary external reality. And I say, after, they are actually, they may be under a big illusion. They may be getting reality wrong. There may be nothing interesting outside them. Because in that case, in the simulation case, the causal structure is really present, which I require it to be. But in the Boltzmann brain case, it's not. So maybe that's a larger gap between appearance and reality than an idealist would tolerate, but it's the kind that a, a structuralist would expect. Okay, so one more question, and then we'll turn to final words. Uh, last question is from Yufun Fei. Uh, Yufun asks, is it possible in a simulation for me to see an apple that's both blue and green at the same time? Is it possible for me to see a circle without seeing the color of it? If simulation becomes really capable and sophisticated, why shouldn't it simulate some of this outrageous stuff? Yeah, it's a great question. And that really, this is a question about what kind of minds are possible. I don't know that it's so much the simulations of the world that might bring this about as so much as, yeah, manipulate, simulate the human brain, uh, manipulate it and change it in various ways. Maybe we'll get it to experience new colors that no, no human brain could experience by giving it you know, five dimensional color space. And yeah, it's a, it's a super interesting question whether you could then get you know, something which is blue and green all over. And this is ultimately a question about the extent of the space of, of possible minds. And it's yeah, AI technology becomes as relevant to this as as say virtual world technology, but I take it these are very much open questions. And once we have that kind of AI and mind simulation technology, some of these uh, old questions like, yeah, could you actually experience something which is red and green all over? Uh, we can try to address using these, uh, using simulation technology.